Today's lesson is lesson 19 of 24, and it's entitled, The Daughter's Deadly Dance. I am Lay Pastor Ellie Green, your presenter for today. And the story today begins with King Herod's wife, Herodias. She hated John the Baptist because he called her an adulteress for leaving her husband, Philip, to marry his brother, Herod. Now the wicked queen determined to use her influence to get even with John the Baptist. First, she persuaded Herod to imprison John. He didn't want to do it. He really did believe that John was a man of God. And then, after she had her daughter, well, I guess she tried to have his head cut off first, and Herod refused. He thought he was a true prophet of God, and he was afraid of the backlash from the people if he killed John. But finally, Herodias, who knew her husband very well, he, she must have known his proclivity for uh, liquor and women because she threw a party for Herod's birthday, invited all of his friends from the noble realm, and then she arranged for her beautiful daughter Salome to dance, and to dance in a very seductive, captivating style that she knew exactly what would happen to her husband, that he would be absolutely overwhelmed uh, in the occasion after he had had his uh, liquor, his wine, and she also knew that he probably would say, I will reward you with whatever you want in celebration of her dance. And her sinister plan worked. After Salome's dance, Herod made a very pompous oath. Ask whatever you will, I'll give you up to one half of my kingdom, Mark 6:23. As the inebriated guest applauded the king's generosity, the girl asked permission to confer with her mother, and then she shocked everyone. Mark 6.24 says that she went to Herodias and said, like, Mama, what shall I ask for? And Mama said, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Herod was stunned by the gruesome request. But all of his shocked friends were watching for his response. What's he going to do? Afraid that he would appear weak if he refused, the proud king reluctantly gave the order. Because of a daughter's dance, a guard was sent immediately to behead John the Baptist, who had been put in prison because of the hatred of the king's wife. Using the government to persecute God's people is nothing new. It continues today in countries around the world. Satan is trying to wipe God out of everyone's thinking. He wants to wipe the mention of God, the mention of the Bible or Christianity from the thinking of everyone in the world. Jesus told his followers the world would hate them and that suffering is a consequence of the Christian faith. I remember my roommate, I went to what is now Washington Adventist University. When I went there in the 1950s, it was Washington Missionary College. And I was teamed up with a roommate who said to me one day, I would really like to be a missionary, but I've made myself be a school teacher in, instead. And I said, if you want to be a missionary, then why don't you? She said, because they're all persecuted. And I don't want to be persecuted. Now, is that, is that a right attitude? I don't, want to, I don't want to work for God because somebody might say something bad about me or persecute me. You know, 
around the world each day, there are over 250 million Christians suffering for their faith. And persecution is steadily getting worse. 2,983 Christians died for their faith last year. They died because they were Christians. Nearly 9,500 churches were attacked in North Korea. There's an estimated 60,000 Christians in labor camps. Do you know why they're in labor camps? For owning a Bible. Just for owning a Bible. And many of them die there. Open Doors USA President and CEO David Curry said, you know, we tend to be self-indulgent. We tend to live in our own little world. You know, our, our concern with me, it's, oh, my goodness, I have a headache. You know, how easily Satan distracts us when the world is truly suffering thousands and thousands of people for Jesus Christ. And we don't even pray for them. You know, if you own a Bible or believe in God, the North Korean government doesn't just arrest you. They arrest your parents, your children, and all your relatives. They want to wipe out even the idea of a different God other than the Kim family who has ruled North Korea since 1948. We truly live in a blessed life. In neighboring China, Christians say they face the worst persecution since Chairman Mayo's cultural revolution. High-tech surveillance is part of the communist government's effort to limit Christian activities. They literally have cameras everywhere and facial recognition. Beijing's goal is to place 600 million active surveillance cameras in the country by the end of 2020. They're all up, they're all running. Nobody will deliver a Bible, meet secretly, or be caught with a Bible without going to jail. See, we have trouble even thinking that way. In our world, the persecution is going to get worse. It's easily believable when we see the vicious attacks in our cities that are happening just in the last couple of years just because, just because somebody doesn't like another person's political party, which is so viciously un-American and not the freedom that America stands for. So will religious persecution come to America? The Bible gives us information on two beasts based on Revelation 13 and tells us their characteristics. We know from these prophecies that the sea beast symbolized the ecclesiastical Roman Empire. In other words, the Roman Empire was a civil, uh, political empire, but it morphed into a religious empire. And the land beast of Revelation 13 symbolized the United States of America. Hopefully you will remember that lesson of their characteristics. Following the details of those beasts of Revelation 13, we move to the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Now we previously discussed the first angel's message that called for the restoration of true worship on the earth. Today, we look at the second angel's message that tells us that Babylon is fallen. Let's look at what that means in Revelation 12 and in Revelation 17, which is our lesson for today. 
you know we were talking coming to church this morning and i was mentioning i read a book about noah this past week the bible clearly says that jesus said that as it was in the days of noah that's how it's going to be just before i come now i remember back to world war ii i was a kid i remember the bombing of pearl harbor i remember the pastor standing in the pulpit saying that it was the end of the world because we now had the power to blow up everything everybody and therefore jesus was coming imminently coming jesus didn't come and so it's like the little girl that yelled wolf wolf you know it didn't happen so everybody relaxes but i'm going to tell you today and i'm going to show you that we are living in the world that is just like Noah's. Noah's day, they killed everybody that got in their way. Noah's day, they took what they wanted by force. Who would have believed that in America, a group of immigrants could walk in and demand to take over an apartment building? or we'll just shoot everybody in the apartment building. It's ours. We want it. We took it. That's the way it was in the day of Noah. Back when the bombs were falling in World War II, we still had morality. We were not like that. We have now come to the point where we are like the people were before the flood. Revelation 14, 8 says, this is the second angel's message, and they followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Fornication and prophecy is false doctrine. An angel flying in the midst of heaven symbolizes the message goes worldwide. And this lesson will address some very straight may be disturbing messages to both Protestant and Catholic believers. Remember, the second angel's message is from Jesus. It's from the one that we all love and follow. Jesus' aim is to save us by telling us the future so that no matter what happens, we're ready. We know it's coming. We've prepared. But the first persecution, let's back up. Towards the end of the first century, both Jews and Christians used the name Babylon to refer to Rome. 1 Peter 5.13 says, She, who is Babylon, send you her greetings. So does my son Mark. So in that era, in that day, Rome was the persecuting power, and it was referred to in scripture as Babylon. But that first persecuting power morphed into something else. Over the years, it grew and consolidated its influence until it involved all nations. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, equates the king of Babylon with Lucifer. And it now makes all nations drink of the wine, of the wrath of her fornication. In prophecy, when you refer to drink, it means that you have ingested the information into your body, just as happens when you drink or eat, which means you believe it. Hook, line, and sinker. Wrath indicates God's displeasure. Fornication symbolizes apostasy from God. So the second angel's message is very serious. It's a prophetic picture of the worldwide religious political system just before Jesus returns. And God gives us a more complete final picture of what happens in Revelation 17 which scholars have never been able to understand until just recently 
as events have unfolded in our world. Let's ask how Babylon is symbolized in Revelation 17. This is what it says. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute sitting on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and those dwelling on the earth became drunk with the wine of her fornication. Let's break it down so we can understand it. The great prostitute is a false religious political system represented by Rome in John's day. But now that prostitute is shown sitting on many waters. Waters includes all of the earth's nations. Waters represents people. Plural means it's every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. And the kings of every nation have committed fornication. What does that mean? That means apostasy from God. And they're all drunk with the wine of her fornication. What does that mean? That's false doctrine. Apostasy from God through false doctrines created by men. Satan has been systematically wiping out God's name from this earth for centuries as the best he possibly can. In the Bible, prophecy, in prophecy in the Bible, a woman symbolizes a church. A pure woman represents God's true church as it's described in Revelation 12. An unfaithful woman represents a church that has apostatized from God. It has gone away from scriptures. We can be certain who this fallen woman is because Revelation 17, 18 says she was ruling when the book of Revelation was written. So we know what this was. History tells us that pagan Rome, Luke 2 verse 1, eventually yielded the authority and power to papal Rome. Now we know that Justinian, the emperor, gave the bishop of Rome power by law over all Christian churches. So we know exactly in history when this happened. Why is Rome called Babylon? Where did the name Babylon come from? It derived from the Tower of Babel that was built about 300 years after the flood, built in direct opposition to God. The city around it was called Babylon, and they were wicked. It didn't take them many generations, even though they were the only ones saved in the ark because of the wickedness of the world. It was 300 years and they'd forgotten everything that God saved them because of how wicked the world was. About 300 BC before Christ to 650 BC before Christ, this Babylon grew into the greatest, most spiritually wicked empire in the world. God wiped out the whole earth because of its wickedness and it didn't take them many generations to become just as wicked again. I've shown you before, the Babylonian king's advisors were astrologers, magicians, and sorcerers. They worshiped 36 gods consolidated into what they called a magic square of their greatest god, the sun. Adding up the rows or the columns of this magic square, either vertically, horizontally, diagonally, adds to 111, 111 
times six, the number of rows, and that totals 666, which was the number of their supreme God, the Son, which they worshiped on the day of the Son, which to this day is referred to as Sunday. That is in direct opposition to the seventh day Sabbath created by God at the end of creation week. People say you are worshiping on the old Moses Jewish Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath was given to the world before there ever was a Jew, an Abraham, a Moses. It was given at the end of creation week. If you doubt me, please read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. God created the Sabbath day, blessed it, made it holy. At Mount Sinai, he then put the law written with his finger on stone and gave it to Moses, who put it in the Ark of the Covenant. The fourth commandment clearly says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And we all know the commandment. So this magic square of the sun, of their gods, that totals 666, has become the mark of the beast. And we'll study that again in the future. It's not a number that's tattooed on your forehead. It's not a number that's tattooed in your hand. It is a number that symbolizes total apostasy from the God who created the world. Because of their vile worship practices, practices that spread all over the world, the Babylonians came down through history known as the personification of opposition and hostility towards God. Now, Ask yourself, as you look, watch the news, look around the world at what is going on, is there opposition and hostility towards God? Yes. Everywhere you look, everything we talk about, everything we see is Satan controlling people. The false doctrines from Babylon spread throughout the earth in so many different ways. Satan has cleverly embedded and established false worship practices through Shintoism, Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islamism, Catholicism, Zoroasterism, apostate Protestantism, as well as a smorgasbord of other isms. They have one thing in common. All of them have one thing in common. They do not keep the commandments of God. They do not have absolute faith in Jesus Christ as their only Lord and Savior. That's the distinguishing characteristic between all those religions and Christianity is they deny the God as creator. Let's look at Revelation 17, verse 3. Then the angel, this is John, um, the disciple John, who's on the Isle of Patmos. He was banished there. Remember, he's the only disciple that was not a martyr. And they would have killed him if they could have gotten by with it. They were afraid of the people. He is having a vision. This is what he said. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Now what is a beast? It's a power. That was covered with blasphemous names. Had seven heads. Heads are the head of governments. And ten horns. Powers. The beast is Satan who provides the foundation upon which the woman, what is a woman in prophecy? Churches. So Satan provides the foundation upon which all false religions sit. 
and the seven heads and ten horns represent the political powers that uphold the world's false religious systems. Consider this. In Revelation 12, the dragon, Satan, is portrayed as having seven heads and ten horns, <clears throat> symbolizing political powers or nations that uphold the religious systems. The, the religious systems that are full of blasphemies against God and his people. <clears throat> also in Revelation 12, the sea beast, under power of the dragon, which is Satan, was permitted to persecute and oppress God's people for 1,260 years. We know it as the Inquisition, beginning in 538 AD and ending in 1798. In Revelation 13, the sea beast has seven heads and ten horns, again symbolizing powers, nations that continue to uphold the world's religious systems. Just, just continuous blasphemy against God. And you know, we're so, we're so accustomed to hear it, hearing it that we hardly blink an eye. It, 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 it's amazing what our world has degenerated into. And it's coming to an end. And I want to say again to you, I've said this before and I'll probably keep saying it, stay out of politics. If you think this person is the savior and the most wonderful thing in the world and you're going to vote that way, just keep quiet about it. If you think the other party is the most wonderful thing and they're the savior, no, they're not. It, it doesn't matter what we think. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Our kingdom and our allegiance is in heaven. It is not in any political power. And we as Christians should in no way ever make anybody out there upset with us because we express our political opinions because it doesn't matter what we think. It only matters what the Word of God says, what prophecy says, what we know is going to happen on this world. And we know, we know what's going to happen. And we know Jesus is coming. And whatever power or political party will be in office to bring Jesus back, that's who's going to win the election. Please, I beg you, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, stay out of it. We don't know God's plan. Now, in Revelation 17, the resurrected sea beast of Revelation 13 appears to bring about sweeping, far-reaching, changes, causes it to morph into Babylon, into what the Bible calls Babylon the Great. So in verse 4, we see that circumstances have greatly altered the religious systems of the world. And we all know it's true. Churches have changed over the years. Now, John sees a worldwide monstrous confederation of all false religious symptom, uh, systems symbolized by a golden cup filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Now, what does that mean? That's the filth of false doctrines. So much so that in verse 5, Babylon receives a new horrible name embedded in her forehead. What does that mean? That symbolizes total acceptance by the world of this fault of the false doctrines. Revelation, Revelation 17, 5 says this, the name written on her forehead was mystery, Babylon the Great. Sin is a mystery. 
the bible is absolutely correct there is no excuse for sin none whatsoever it arose out of satan's heart in heaven mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots in other words the mother of all these false doctrines and of the abominations of the earth in other words Babylon the Great is no longer just spiritual Babylon. It's now become a false religious system that's indoctrinated the world. She has become the culmination of all the world's false religious systems. That includes idolatry, witchcraft, Belief in reincarnation, astrology, spiritualism, ghost, depending on the works that we do instead of the grace of God for salvation. Belief in immortality of the soul. I have a neighbor talking to her just recently and she said to me, my, my, my comfort is knowing my husband's in heaven. Um, many of you know me really, really well. What are the chances that I didn't say anything? That would be zero. And I said, uh, you need to come to Bible study at my house on Tuesday nights because I can show you in the Bible that that's not true. <laughs> uh, that is immortality of the soul. Can you imagine how that's caught on with the whole world and they believe you die, you flit off to heaven? Or if I happen to not like you, then maybe you went to the place where you're going to burn eternally. You know, it portrays God as a monster. What belief could be more destructive to loving God with all of our hearts and souls? You're removing all knowledge of God's Ten Commandments, making people ignorant of God's Ten Commandments. Take it out of the homes, the schools, the workplace, and the world's governments. Accepting and teaching small children that alternate lifestyles are okay. You know, look at everything that's going on in this world. And it's the abomination. The Bible calls it the world has gotten to the point where the Bible calls it abominations of the earth. Are we there? We're there. We're right where Noah was and there that day. We're right where Sodom and Gomorrah was. How does God describe Babylon? And what does he urge his people to do? And this is Revelation 18 too. And he cried mightily with a strong voice. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It's become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18, 2 and 3. God says that the false religious systems of the world have become the home of devils and evil spirits that the sins are so offensive to God that you need to get out of it because God is going to destroy this earth. Are there any signs today of a worldwide alliance of all religions that are teaming up with world governments to control the earth? If you don't already know this, let me tell it to you and open your eyes. Yes, Pope Francis says the new world order needs to happen now with the United Nations in control. That was in October 9, 2020. Pope Francis is pushing the Green Sabbath and a one world religion. Look it up. Don't believe me. I invite you not to believe me. I invite you to look it up. Number three, the United Nations Agenda 21 and sustainable development. There are 17 goals of sustainable development I started to put them all up here, but they're so depressing. You will understand why we have open borders. 
if you understand the United Nations Sustainable Development. One of their goals is no nation has borders. We are all one. One of the goals is that nobody owns individually property, that every, the property belongs, like the Indians used to believe, the world uh, when we came to America. It all belongs to the great God. We all have equal access to it. They're pushing a one world bank, a one world monetary system, one world law. So the law in China would be the same law as in America. Just read, don't read the titles. Sit down and read the whole sustainable goal of each of the 17. Understand that the United States, starting with George Bush, who signed us on to this, through the Clintons, who signed us on, to the present president, who just pushed a new bill through Congress for the Green New Deal. Do not believe me? Go home and look it up. We are in this up to our eyeballs. Sustainable development is with us. In addition, the Club of Rome, now this has nothing to do with the Roman Empire. It has to do with the men who started this club, started it in the city of Rome. And more on that in just a minute. Let's begin with number one. Pope Francis says that new world order needs to happen now with the UN in charge. In his latest encyclical, encyclical Fratani Tutti, if I'm saying that right, he issues a plea for the nations of the world to hand their sovereign power over to the United Nations. Did you hear that? So we would not be a sovereign power with our own independent laws. And Pope Francis says this will lead us all into a new world order. He's calling for a green Sabbath, which would require all people to close all the shops, mandate a worldwide day of rest on Sunday. He says that people are now used to enforced lockdowns, so it wouldn't be hard to accomplish. On 12 different occasions, Pope Francis has called for a one world religion to unite all religions into one brotherhood. However, on this issue, he is not standing alone. There are many other organizations are, who are also attempting to unite all religions. Just to mention a few, there's the John 17 movement. This is a Protestant initiative in America trying hard to bring us all together in love. Doesn't that sound good? There's also the World Council of Churches actively engaged in attempting religious unification that we all might be one. Then there's Church Center for the United Nations, CCUN in New York, that serves as a vital hub for ecumenical communities of the world. And they're working towards peaceful religious coexistence among nations. The United Nations Agenda 21 and Sustainable Development Agenda 21 was established at the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1992. And they published this Sustainable Development Plan asking all the leaders of all the world's nations to sign on, pledging their nation to participate in Agenda 21 and the Sustainable Development Plan. George H.W. Bush signed the United States on to this Green Plan at the summit in Brazil in 1992. Most of us didn't have a clue. In 1993, President Bill Clinton, in compliance with Agenda 21, signed Executive Order 12852 to create a President's Council on Sustainable Development in order to harmonize the United States policies with the United States or with the United Nations Agenda 21.
did you note that it does not matter if it was republican or democrat did you notice that did you notice that their presidents of both parties signing the united states up to this the term sustainable development was first introduced to the world in the pages uh, 1987 report uh, by the United Nations World Commission on Environmental and Development. It was authored by Harlem Brundtland, Vice President of the World Socialist Party. That's who wrote the Sustainable Development Program that we're signed on to. The United Nations states that Agenda 21 is a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, improve lives and prospects of everyone everywhere. And on the surface, it sounds wonderful, but it is in fact world domination orchestrated by Satan. We're, we've been told for, since John wrote Revelation that this is coming. It's such a warm, fuzzy glow to deceive the earth's inhabitants who are unaware of God's prophecies, who have no idea the Bible has predicted all of this was coming. And I'm standing before you today saying, it's not coming, it's here. 17 goals of sustainable development of the United Nations will end life as we know it in America if they manage to carry out this agenda. It is a Marxist agenda. Again, do not believe me. Go home and look it up. It is actively in place. And part of it is the letting of everybody go that has committed a felony, the things that we're struggling with in America. Read all 17 sustainable development goals in their entirety. You owe it to yourself because Revelation predicted it's coming and you owe it to yourself as a Christian to understand that the prophecy has predicted this years ago. Don't read just the titles. Each goal seems humanitarian and harmless, but as you read, you will understand how each goal can only be accomplished if there is a new world order, a one world religion in place, and America must be socialist Marxist for this plan to succeed. That impacts your money, that impacts worshiping here on Sabbath, that impacts having Bibles to read when we want to, that impacts everything you and I know as a Christian serving God. And when I tell you that this radio station reaches out to Charlotte and you need to support it, I'm telling you that's the way we can still reach the world. We can't go preach to the world, but we can support that radio that does preach to the world because it's here and sometimes I feel like we're the ten virgins and we're the five that are sleeping. Let's not. Let's tell the world. Please understand that the Green New Deal you hear about is Agenda 21. That is what they're talking about. To highlight just a few of the goals, let me do this very quickly. Uh, and I, I've already done it. Equal housing. Um, population control is another part of this. Um, no urban development, all of the Earth's resources to be used equally among all of us, equality in jobs, in healthcare, in education, global financial equality, uh, and I said a mandatory one day of rest. Does it sound far-fetched, impossible? Does it sound like this is a conspiracy theory? And, and I'm just up here, you know, blowing smoke. Everything I'm telling you is absolutely real. It's the truth. Now, 
It's going to happen because God's predicted it will happen, but it will happen on God's schedule. What's really interesting is that Revelation 17, 12 explains how Satan has been working in the background to prepare the world for implementation of a new world order controlled by the United Nations. Verse 12, and I want you to listen to this. Verse 12 says that the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive um, authority as kings along with the beast. So what are these ten kingdoms and how will they function? For centuries, Bible scholars have tried to figure this out. Let me just throw this in. To a group of businessmen formed the Club of Rome in April of 1968. Bill Gates was one of them. To solve complex, interconnected challenges in our world. They divided the world into regions that they call, get this, they call them the Ten Nations, exactly what Revelation 17 called it. And they divided it in order to consolidate regional control of the earth. Did you get that? That's why they divided it, so that the United Nations could consolidate regional control of the earth. Keep in mind, verses 13 and 14 of Revelation 17, they have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb. Who is that? Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. God gave us this prophecy so we'd be prepared for the storm, never afraid of the storm, because we learn from prophecy that no matter what the storm looks like, God is in control. God is in control of all of this. I'm telling you, he wrote it down in the Bible for us so that we would know, and God always wins. Trust God. Trust God and be absolutely faithful, and we have no worries. Yes, we know it's coming. But you know, we're into a campaign here to remodel our church, fix up our church. People say, oh, how will I have the money to give? You know, I, I, I believe we should all die broke. We should give everything we have to the Lord. We're awfully concerned with hanging on to things. When all of this is coming, we will not be able to buy or sell. That's what's predicted in the Bible. We know what's coming. Do we hunker down and be, live in terror? No. We should be the happiest, freest people on the face of this earth. Because no matter what happens, God will take care of us. Are we going to die? Nope. Are we going to live through this? Yes. Are we going to live through it? Drinking our Coca-Cola, sitting in our Archie Bunker chair, watching our TV, thinking about where we'll go out and eat tomorrow? No. We will probably be fleeing to the mountains and hiding out. But God is going to protect us. This is the beauty, the beauty of holiness. This is the beauty of being God's child. Is that while we won't be comfortable, we will be here to meet Jesus when he comes again. All of these things are happening all around us and more that I don't even have time to tell you. Please don't just listen to CNN and Fox News and then ABC and NBC. Please don't let that be your source of information. Our news channels only tell us what they want us to hear. Please study. Open the book of Revelation and read. Get a Bible commentary so that you understand what it's saying. And let's be prepared for what's coming on the earth. And when our neighbors and friends are concerned and worried, we can say, you don't need to worry. You do not need to worry. Jesus is coming.
and he's got us in the palm of his hands. And we should be the happiest, most unafraid people on earth, telling people that Babylon has fallen and Jesus is coming soon.